Good afternoon. Welcome to the seventh meeting of the Communications Security Reliability and Interoperability Council 7, which is now open. Today, we will first listen to a presentation from Kathy Whitbeck of Insight and Chair of Working Group 2 the rep on a report on the review and recommendations on optional security features in 3G PP standards impacting 5G non-standalone architecture. This report addresses the task given to CISRIC 7 by the FCC to evaluate the transition from 4G to 5G to ensure continued reliability, interoperability, and security. It follows on a previous CISRIC 7 report on risks to 5G from legacy vulnerabilities and best practices for mitigation, which looked at risks to 5G from legacy vulnerabilities and proposed best practices. We will then hear updates from the other working group chairs, and I turn the meeting over to CISRIC 7 Chair Charlotte Field. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Um, for the, like as, as uh, Suzanne said, the seventh meeting of the Com Communication Security Reliability and Interoperability Council. I hope everyone is well, and um, we look forward to hearing from Kathy today, as well as getting updates from the other uh, four working groups that are prepared to share them a little, a little bit later on. I'm going to start with taking attendance. If you can just say yay or nay, that'd be perfect. Yay, if you're here. Also, Mark Annis. Uh, here. Thank you. Thank you. Brandon Adley. Okay. Uh, Mary Boyd is not going to be here. Mary Boyd, I'm sorry. Mary? Yes, ma'am. I'm here. Thank you. Thank Wade you. Buckner. I'm here. Thank you. Brian Daly. Brian Daly is here. Thank you. Jay English. I'm here. Thank you. Lori Flaherty. Afternoon, Lori's here. Thank you. Uh, I think Craig Fugat is not going to be here, correct? That's correct. Right. Robert Gessner. I am here. Thank you. James Gorky. Is now joined. I'm here, Charlotte. Thank you. Mark Hess. I'm here, Charlotte. Morning. Good afternoon for you, I guess. Antoine yeah. Johnson. Good afternoon, Charlotte. Antoine Johnson, it's here. Thank you very much. Brooke Cassetti. Present. Thank you. Chandra Katara. Jeff Littlejohn. Tim Morello. Michelle Manelli McNerney. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Danny McPherson is not going to be here, correct? Yes, but uh, young Kim standing in his place. Yes, I have young Kim. Yep. Susan Miller. Jackie Waltermuth for Susan Miller. Thank you. Richard Perlota. Christina Puzak, Michael Rapp. Here. Thank you. Pat Roberts. Here. Thank you, Pat. Travis Russell. Sorry, Francisco here. Sanchez. Okay, thank you. That's Travis. Yep. Francisco Happy holidays, Francisco is here. Thank you very much. Dorothy Spears Dean. President Charlotte. Thank you very much, Dorothy. Brian Trosper. Present. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Watkins. Steve Watkins is here. Thank you. Kathy's here. Right, Kathy's Kathy? here. Okay. Kathy's here. <laughs> John Williamson. So we have a quorum, so that's fantastic. Thanks everyone for taking time out of your day. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Kathy, who's going to be giving the overview of um, 
working group on uh, the working group two, managing security risks and transition to 5G. Kathy, you have the floor. All right, thank you. Korean, can we pull up our slides? There we go. Now, I would like to point out this is our abbreviated title. It used to be quite a bit longer, um, and we will unpack it as we go. So first, I want to thank you for your time today. I want to thank the FCC and the Council for asking these Im important security questions as we transition U.S. networks to 5G. Next slide. Um, this is our final report for this CISRIC Council for Working Group 2. Um, as mentioned, report one covered the risks to 5G security from legacy vulnerabilities and was submitted to the council for approval in June. If the council opts to accept today's report, this will wrap up the task assigned for working group two for CISRIC 7. Next slide. Uh, our agenda today, uh, we'll do a brief background on working group two and recap our findings in report one. We'll take a look at the 5G non-standalone architecture, NSA, um, that, that we've been focused on in this working group. We'll do a brief level set on the difference between working group two and working group three. Uh, then we'll, look, we'll dig into the optional features that we've been tasked with assessing in this report. Um, and finally, we'll walk through uh, the working group's findings and recommendations for both the FCC and industry. There is a glossary in the back of the report. I will try to avoid acronyms, but 35 years in the industry, I'm afraid they just sometimes come out. Uh, next slide. Uh, who participated in the working group? I, I got to tell you, this was a really impressive uh, team of people who came together to assess, review, and recommend for this council. Um, in addition to thanking the participants of the working group, I'd like to thank the organizations and the companies that allowed them to car carve out time from their busy schedules for this important work. Uh, Leif Thibodeau got us off to a strong start with report one, and the team kept that momentum going through re report two. Vetting technical standards is not for the faint of heart and the team rose to the challenge. Next slide, please. In some cases, we were privileged, lucky enough to have two representatives from an organization and those contributions were again invaluable. We couldn't have done it without them. Next slide, please. So let's get grounded on the focus of this team. Uh, this team was tasked with examining the wireless ecosystem as operators transition from 4G to 5G. Transition being the key word. The council asked the team to evaluate the impacts and implications for known risks as we add 5G elements to US networks. Um, as operators are introducing 5G, the industry is building on existing standards and leveraging existing 4G LTE infrastructure. So we looked at this transition specifically through the lens of confidentiality, integrity, and availability in order to assess impacts, make sure things didn't degrade, and that we weren't introducing new vulnerabilities. Next slide. Uh, the FCC asked us to look at um, anything that may carry over from existing vulnerabilities in earlier wireless technologies and to recommend best practices to mitigate those risks. And next slide. The FCC then asked the team to review recent output from the 3GPP security working group to assess impacts. Um, we were asked to examine the optional features and standards to, um, that could diminish the effectiveness of 5G security and to make recommendations to address those gaps. That included identifying any updates um, to the standards that might be needed. Um, we touched, uh, and we touched on 3GPP use of mandatory to deploy, optional to configure in our September update. Um, today, we'll focus on what we found in that space. Next slide, please. So the report we're submitting for your consideration today builds on report one that was accepted in June. The reports are meant to be read together. Um, both reports are pretty dense technical reads. Um, we chose not to repeat a lot of the foundational material that was in report one. Together, it's a combined 99 pages of gripping technical reading. 
Um, in the first report, we concluded that the risks associated with 4G carry over to 5G NSA deployments, the non-standalone architecture. Um, the team did not find that the introduction of a 5G new radio to the LTE core um, changes or degrades those fundamentals. That was good news. Um, our effort here was really on a laser focus um, for reviewing the threat landscape as the industry migrates to 5G. So let's look at some pictures. Next slide, please. You've seen this slide before. Um, both Working Group 2 and Working Group 3 have been using it as a visual to help describe the scope of the effort. Um, the two groups have really been working closely over the past 18 months to evaluate 5G. The distinction we're making is really in the core. So as you look at the left two on the diagram, uh, working group two has been focused on option three, the non-standalone core, while working group three has been focused on the emerging uh, 5G standalone core. And I know you're gonna hear from Farouk in a little bit. Um, by making that distinction, the teams were able to logically divide the assessment of security standards. Between release 15 and 16, between 33.401 and 33.501, which are really where the bulk of the security requirements are for, for this evolution, um, that was a logical break point for us. And I think this was a very effective um, tool that Farouk and, and Lee came up with back in the early days to help us uh, stay in sync. Um, a note about options seven and four on this uh, slide, they may be implemented internationally, but they were out of scope for this discussion. We focused on options two and three because that's where we're, what we're seeing in US networks. Uh, next slide, please. So when we talk about the non-standalone architecture, um, what we're seeing today with uh, US operators is that um, there's an opportunity to leverage the existing 4G LTE network for control plane traffic. In, in the transition, we're retaining the use of the 4G evolved packet core, the EPC, uh, for switching and operators are able to add the 5G new radios uh, connecting them to the existing 4G cores. In essence, the industry in a lot of ways is pre-positioning 5G assets um, with their advanced security features into the network. Um, and this is the migration path that we're seeing with US operators as we're moving deeper into 5G architectures. Um, and we've got another slide that, uh, another picture here to help illustrate why we're doing that. Next slide, please. Um, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. This is a new diagram. Uh, it's our attempt to illustrate that the 5G NSA architecture leverages the existing 4G LTE core and to help understand why. Um, the diagram shows that 5G new radio reuses that core. Operators do that in order to support both 4G LTE and 5G capable devices. Backward compatibility and interoperability are table stakes here, and we've got to make sure that we don't break what's out there today as we make that migration. Uh, option three, the non-standalone architecture we're talking about relies on user plane traffic being carried by the 5G new radio, while control plane functions are supported and carried by the legacy LTE, LTE radios or the RAN. Um, in this figure, the LTE RAN continues to support not only 4G LTE devices, but also serves the added benefit to seamlessly support new devices um, the, that are both 4G and 5G. Those are the newer devices that we're seeing coming out. By structuring this way, option three supports the rapid introduction of 5G while also allow, allowing a migration path from existing LTE only capable cell sites. And as I mentioned, 33401 is the 3GPP um, subsection that we've been looking at in the standards. Um, the standard covers security features, security mechanisms for the evolved packet system and the EPC and the security pr uh, procedures performed within the EP EPS, including the EPC and the radio access network. 
Next slide. Um, so the team took both a top-down and a bottoms-up approach to, to this assessment. Um, in order to look at the optional features, um, I got to give a shout out to Scott Paretsky at Erickson for this one. We literally looked at every could, should, may, can, every wiggle word in the um, standard that could be perceived or interpreted by a carrier as optional. And once we identified that full body of potentially perceived optional features, uh, we then map that set of requirements to security categories, looking at, um, looking at requirements in terms of their impact to confidentiality, integrity, authentication of, of either the control or the user planes. And that there's a nice chart on page 13, table four in our report that gives an overview of that. Um, for that chart, I, I really want to give a shout out to Working Group through 3 and DJ Shai over at MITRE. Um, that was a, an incredibly helpful piece of collaborative work to put that together. Uh, from there, the sub-teams performed analysis to assess the reasons for the optional designation, um, looked at impacts to known risks, uh, looked at potential new risks, and provided a, a set of findings and recommendations that you see in the report today. Um, as, the work, as the group worked through this, we leveraged the framework outlined in NIST 8 839, Assessing Risk and Impact in recommendations. Next slide. So what, is, what are these options and why are there so many, as I call them, wiggle words, um, things that might be perceived as optional for carriers? Um, when we look at re release 15, uh, what we saw is that there, there were valid technical reasons why things were optional um, or that they needed to be optional at this, at this point. First, not all, all optional options are relevant to all networks um, as requirements may be op, a requirement may be optional because it's only relevant to a specific use case that may or may not apply to an individual carrier's network. The, car the operator is gonna need to evaluate whether this makes sense within the context of what they're, they're transmitting across their network. Um, there are um, standards that may have different but equal paths to meet the requirements. So a technical solution or a use case um, really needs to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis to determine what is the right set of requirements for securing that, that traffic. Um, standards bodies at a global level um, need to uh, need to accommodate conflicting national and regional needs. Some nations, some uh, regions require the ability to individually determine if they'll support a security capability. Uh, 3GPP operates at a global level and, and we need to operate within that ecosystem. So there may need to be the ability to turn it off. Um, and of course, there are legal restrictions and export limitations on certain security related technologies, encryption. And finally, and I think this gets to the heart of, of uh, what we're seeing and what we were asked to evaluate is really that newly developed features built into a specific network component may be optional because of where or how they fit into the overall as built architecture. Um, let me pause there for a second. Um, the key line in the report is really that the evolution of emerging technologies necessitates the option to control the introduction of new features in existing networks. In a lot of ways, what we see here is carriers pre-positioning security features in the network that as we get to the 5G core will become mandatory. So in release 33401, these features are optional as they're connecting to a non-standalone core that may not have the corresponding pieces to go with it. But as it moves into the 5G core, they become mandatory. Uh, next slide, please. 
So what did we find? Um, risk and impact are really key words here. Uh, there were a number of categories where the risk is low, the mitigation is already in motion in 3GPP, and or the optional nature of the specification becomes mandatory in 5G SA core, the standalone core. As 5G radios move from NSA to SA, these features move from optional to mandatory. So there were a number of items that we identified, we documented, we didn't have a specific recommendation, um, but we wanted to include for, because we were being inclusive here on all of the requirements and all of the shoulds, coulds, mays, and woulds. Um, Within the report, we created a finding sec section to document those observations. And I won't go through each one of these, but just a couple quick examples. Um, the FCC had asked us to recommend updates to 3GPP standards based on what we found in our analysis. In the case of control plane radio resource control user requirements, uh, 6.1.2 there, control plane RRCUE, the team identified a concern around cellular internet of things, but we were also able to confirm that the issue had already been identified and addressed via a change requ request in release 16. So that's moving in the right direction. Um, I'm gonna take another quick side trip here because we did put the words public safety on this slide and I suspect that will not go unnoticed, Mary Boyd. Um, because there were some requirements specifically around uh, IOPS, isolation operations for public safety. And that was a new one for the team. Um, and we were being inclusive with the analysis of 33401. So we went down that road to see what was going on there. Um, isolation operations for public safety uh, was first introduced in release 13 as an innovative concept truly a concept. Um, the, the thought was, could we find a way to, could the industry find a way to communicate between um, wireless towers, E-node B, cell sites that don't have backhaul in the middle of a disaster, for example. Um, so really thinking outside the box in terms of um, network connectivity. And technologists are continuing to innovate on that thought. Um, and as, as happens in innovation, each iteration of technology requirements defines that a little bit further, gets a little bit further in terms of crafting what this is and how it would work. And in 33401, there are a number of requirements that help to identify what this might be able to do. Um, right now, this is very much in the development phase. It's in that innovation phase. Um, the public safety oriented feature is not commercially available at this time. Um, the working group expects 3GPP will continue to iterate and innovate, um, but since it's not in uh, commercial networks at this time, it's really in the uh, findings and one to watch. Next slide, please. Uh, so what are we recommending? Um, we are in a period of rapid innovation. We're finding, uh, with our findings in report one regarding risks associated with the introduction of 5G new radio to the NSA architecture, the working group does not recommend additional regulation. Uh, working group two recommends that the FCC continue to emphasize LTE best practices and recommendations from previous CISRIC councils. There's a great body of work and we need to continue to leverage that while we're in our non-standalone architecture on our road to 5G. Uh, next slide. The working group recommends that the FCC continue to, su to, to support the industry's focus on the flexible and unimpeded deployment of secure next generation networks. Um, the FCC should leverage its unique role within government and continue to support the market driven advances and unimpeded deployment. Uh, we wanna take advantage of the new security features in a timely manner. And as I mentioned, many of these things move from optional to mandatory and all of these pre-positioned features that are in the network um, we're able to take advantage of as we connect to a 5G SA core. Next slide, please. 
In terms of optional features, um, the recommendation is to focus forward. Uh, features that are optional become mandatory, um, and that's the direction we need to go. Next slide. Uh, recommendations for industry. Industry should continue to collaborate to ensure security by design. Um, this effort has been, uh, I think uh, there are so many efforts that are going on in this space and we need to continue to participate and take advantage of the learnings from those organizations. Uh, stakeholders should continue to focus on best practices for working with vendors and suppliers to reduce cybersecurity risk. Uh, the FCC and industry have collaborated to build the solid body of knowledge and we need to make sure that we execute accordingly. Next slide. In terms of user playing confidentiality and integrity, uh, this recommendation goes hand in hand with our recommendation in report one around device security. In report one, the team recommended consideration of a device security management system for 5G networks. Uh, during this transition time, we recommend that higher layer security protections, um, we recommend carriers use higher layer security protections, but we point out that this is an area that needs future focus. Next slide. In terms of NAS signaling and confidentiality and integrity, uh, the working group, two, uh, working group two recommends that operators pay close attention to signaling messages. Uh, security can be enhanced by adding confidentiality and or integrity protection on unprotected signaling messages. Um, the working group also points out that this needs to be balanced with the risks associated with breaking critical functions. Um, Depending on the network and the use cases involved, this really may not be practical, but operators need the, uh, operators need the flexibility to consider how, how many legacy things will break and what the, the value is based on the use case. And next slide. And finally, uh, the, the working group recommends in, um, or reminds industry, I should say, about IPsec configuration options. Determining whether to select tunnel or transport mode or when and how to deploy security gateways should be design decisions based on risk analysis and use case requirements. Uh, the working group reminds carriers to consult best practices in the design and implementation of network elements. Uh, next slide. Let me pause there for questions. Do we have any questions from the council? I'm sure you all enjoyed our acronym soup. <laughs> yeah, we're going to add them to the acronym dictionary. Um, I'll just call for que questions one more time. Are there any questions for uh, Kathy? Or any other members of Working Group 2? With that, um, I'd like to take a vote of um, does, the, does the council support the recommendations as put forward by the working group two? Yay or nay? Yay. 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 Any nay? Okay, Thank Char you very much. Um, Thank you, Charlotte. Charlotte, I would like to um, just pass along again my thanks for the members of Working Group 2. We had great debate. A lot of critical thought went into the report. Um, I also want to make sure that we thank Working Group 3 for the great collaboration and Working Group 4 for the public safety discussion. Yes, thank you very much, Kathy. I, um, as, a, as a member of Working Group 2, I saw a lot of great interaction um, with uh, uh, with uh, Farouk's team, as well as when we had the conversation about IOPS um, and the impact of that as well. So with that, um, CISRC has accepted Working Group 2's recommendations, and now we'll move forward with the Working Group updates. Um, first up will be Working Group 1, Alert Originator Standard Operating Procedures. 
and Michelle Minnelli will be representing um, that group's uh, output. Michelle, turning it over to you. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, so um, good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Next slide, please. Um, so giving you an update, we've had two reports um, that have been uh, tasked with our working group. Next slide. Uh, the first report was completed in September. Um, that was the report where it was directed to the team, to the CISRIC 7. I'm sorry, can you go back one? Thank you. So the first report that we completed in September, just to remind everybody, it was to recommend uh, model emerging, uh, emergency alerting communications SOPs. Uh, that emphasized engagement with all entities that contribute to the dissemination of fast and reliable emergency information to the public. Um, we were then um, shortly around that time frame uh, provided with the second task, and that is going to be the task that I'm updating everybody today. And uh, the FCC task CISRIC 7, uh, which ended up coming to working group one to recommend the overall best solution or solutions to resolve the, uh, the duplicate uh, alert issue that occurs with weather emergency messages, um, in some cases from the National Weather Service. Um, the purpose of that task group of, of what we were able to do is we got a large group of people from all the various stakeholders um, from government side, as well as from broadcast, uh, the uh, vendors uh, who create the systems that in, uh, ingest this information, uh, to the cable companies, to the radio broadcast, uh, all the way through through the uh, dissemination chain. Uh, and our report is expected to be completed uh, in March and we'll be coming back to the council uh, once we complete that uh, in that in that quarter. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit of background of that description, a little bit further into it. So under certain conditions, um, the public receives duplicate National Weather Service alerts that are issued over uh, the emergency alert system. So it's important to recognize that we are going to try to keep as much scope on this and, and keep that scope focused on the duplication that occurs via the emergency alert system. Um, they can be due to technical differences or the processing of, of these of generating the broadcast of the alerts between the NWS systems and the EAS systems. Um, while EAS devices are required to reject duplicate alerts, um, there are some cases that result in these uh, messages that go out that are slightly different whether of how the systems interpret those messages that they that it's interpreted as though they are different um, warnings or products um, and then they're issued again um, you know this in turn can can lead to various things such as warning fatigue and and, and various um, you know other, other situations and uh, and interruptions with various broadcasts as well um, so we're looking at various uh, ways uh, to look to find out what are those scenarios that uh, when these duplicate alerts occur, and then how as an entire stakeholder group, um, you know, can we look at that and have recommendations on how to mitigate those in concrete uh, examples and ways um, to implement future ways to avoid this from occurring. Uh, next slide, please. So where are we at and what's our deliverables and schedule? So uh, once again, we're kind of broke, broken this up into kind of three areas. We're evaluating the various dissemination channels that contribute to EAS evacuation uh, activation. Um, making sure we review each of those paths. Um, and then the working group is going to um, identify potential causes of these alert, uh, duplicate alerts and then provide the recommended mitigation solutions for receiving those. Um, once again, our final report is planned for com completion in March 2021. And we are, you look at the next slide, um, we're currently on, uh, on schedule to do that. This has been a very robust conversations we've had among the team. Um, next slide, please. 
If you look at the list of the working group members, um, I am just beyond impressed be, with the amount of feedback and information that has been provided across the board in the value chain of getting these messages out and alerted to the American public. Um, as we're all in this, we're in this to save lives. And that is what these products and these messages are going out. And we want to do that in the most safe and manner that is going to make, uh, allow the American public to react uh, and, and take the necessary actions they need. Uh, so you see a huge, uh, a large group of uh, active members that have been um, involved in this task. Uh, and then on the next page, the alternate members, we have um, several individuals um, from companies um, to have uh, alternates and uh, additional individuals working with those uh, with the team and appreciate everybody's uh, time uh, we have weekly meetings and um, or biweekly meetings and it's, it's moving along well. So last slide is just we'll, we'll at the end we're currently on track to complete the report so. Uh, I will turn it back over uh, to you unless there's any other questions. Are there any questions for Michelle? Thank you so Thank much, you, everybody. Um, and uh, thanks for standing in for Craig. And we're going to turn to working group three, managing security risk and emerging 5G. Farouk, you have the floor. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first, let me thank Kathy for providing an excellent summary of 5G security and the reason for optionality makes my life a lot easier. I can be a lot um, more brief. Next slide, please. So um, the working group three uh, background, we are looking at uh, really 16 um, security aspects, uh, much like uh, working group two was looking at really 15 and 16. Next slide, please. So we have two objectives. The first one was to look at release 15 and release 16 standards in 3GPP and look into any uh, potential security issues that we needed to identify. And as Cathy uh, uh, mentioned, the second objective that we have is with respect to optional features uh, that are in standards and Cathy provided a really uh, good summary of why there are those optional features. So we are looking at those optional features in um, 3GPP specification and, um, if, and coming up with some recommendation on what would be the best answer for North America networks to make sure that they are secure and interoperable. Next slide, please. So we had report one on uh, risk introduced by release 15 and 16 standards, and that was completed. Next slide, please. And report two is on the optional features that are in release 15 and 16 and provide some uh, recommendation. Next slide, please. So the status of release, uh, our working group three, as we mentioned, report one was completed on September 2020. Report two is um, scheduled to be completed in March 2021. Um, it's progressing rather well. Um, I, I got to tell you, I mean, the, the, the work that we are doing is really interesting, and we have a really, really good discussion going on in uh, in our working group. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's like we are right on the, the, the edge of the technology discussion in 3GPP to the point that sometimes the discussion is, all right, are we getting ahead of 3GPP? It's like this, this, this subject was just discussed this week in 3GPP, so it's a very exciting and very active group that uh, the progress is going really well. Next slide, please. With that said, I would like to thank all the group members. You know, as I always say, without the participation, active participation and contribution of the working group, uh, members, uh, you know, you cannot get any work progress done, but um, I really appreciate the work that is done, you know, that some going to the weekly meetings. So I really want to um, and thank the working group members for being so actively involved. Next slide, please. 
We also have a number of alternatives, and often these alternatives are just as active, if not more active. So thank you for the um, 3GPP uh, uh, Working Group 3 alternates. Next slide, please. So Kathy went through this thing to great detail. Um, and, you know, in Working Group 2, the focus was on NSA. The focus of Working Group 3, as Kathy mentioned, is really on the option to the standalone with the 5G core network. So that is our primary focus. Next slide, please. And this is our last slide, just a status update. The work is ongoing. Uh, we are actually developing the baseline. The progress is going rather well. Uh, we have uh, frequent uh, calls uh, every, from once a week to every other week. And we will continue to provide update to uh, the CISRI console, although the next update in March will be uh, to present our final uh, report. Madam Chair, I believe that's my last slide. Next slide, please. Thank you, Farouk. Uh, any questions for Farouk? Okay. Thank you very much, Farouk, and Working Group 3. Um, we're going to move on to Working Group 4, uh, which is all about 911 security vulnerabilities. And I will turn it over to Mary Boyd. Mary, uh, you have the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, happy Wednesday to you. Yes, this is the team that's all about 911. Uh, first of all, I'd like to just say congratulations to Kathy and her team on acceptance of the report. Uh, we were honored to be able to partner with them. <clears throat> and I'm also delighted to see that someone else works on 911 issues. So thank you guys. Uh, next, next slide, please. Um, this, uh, just as a reminder, our charter and, and our focus for this CISRIC initiative is really about the transition of a legacy 911 network into what we see as a hybrid state in that transition, then fully into an IP operating environment and the risk that can occur during that transition. Uh, we are focused really on cybersecurity uh, within Working Group 4. Next slide, please. We were asked uh, to work on three objectives. The first was really to identify the current status of interoperability of our 911 networks uh, and the in the United States. We, we have completed that, as you'll see in a moment. We also worked on identifying what security risk um, are prevalent um, in the networks or possibilities of being prevalent in the networks. And then our final request from the commission was to, as we identified those vulnerabilities from a security standpoint, we, we look at the risk level and then also what the expense would be to try to uh, remediate uh, those issues or and be proactive on them. Next slide, please. Um, our first report, as indicated, was the current status um, of the interoperability of 911 in our country. That report has been completed. Uh, next slide, please. Report two is also completed. That was looking at the hybrid architecture and identifying the risk uh, from security, cybersecurity standpoint. Uh, that was presented and adopted by council. And that is really what has launched our current initiative um, as it has use case uh, scenarios in it. Uh, next slide, please. Our third and final report that we're working on right now um, is the, as I indicated, looking at the vulnerabilities, but looking at the remediation expense. Uh, next slide, please. The uh, our working group members, just as you know, identified by all of our colleagues on the on these working groups that lead this effort. Really, our strength is in this group of people that you see on this slide. Um, I've indicated in the past this is really the who's who of 911. Uh, when you get to uh, chair an initiative for the commission uh, and you get the you know the talents of this team, it makes our jobs really really easy. And uh, and I want to thank each and every one of the members. And on the next slide, please. As Farouk indicated, we do have some alternate members for certain companies. Um, 
and organizations. Uh, these these members are active and as important um, as the primary uh, designated representatives. So I, you know, I want to say thank you, uh, Tom Breen, once again. I'm just going to do a little bit of a special call out and a shout out to this man. Uh, he is the, you know, the foundation of our initiative. He he is the, the scribe. He keeps um, all the baseline documents uh, monitored, and you don't get to make a contribution without putting it on the Addis workspace. So I'll do a, once again, a shout out to Addis uh, for supporting our initiatives. It does, definitely makes it easier to archive all of our contributions and our baseline documents on, on that workspace. So thank you, and thank you all to our, our members of Workgroup 4. Next slide, please. Um, this will be where I give you an update on where we stand today with our third and final report. Um, it is titled Measuring the Risk Magnitude and Remediation Cost in 911 and NG911 Networks. Next slide, please. It has your basic structure that, uh, that we follow in terms of the Commission's requests to, for consistency in these reports. Uh, it will include our standard executive summary, the normal introductory sections that go into these reports. Um, the analysis on this, on this particular report is we're looking at the general impacts on cyber attacks specific to the 911 networks and to the public safety entities. Uh, part of our charter is always best practices. Uh, we indicated in our prior report that we would roll our sleeves up on not only the evaluation of the current best practices, but really the need for, for new best practices. And that will be a part of our findings, as well as what can be done to um, mitigate the impacts and the cost. Um, I, if you'll note on that third bullet under our findings, uh, we're looking at what can be implemented, particularly when you see the role that government has to play in this. It is a partnership between the private sector and public safety governmental entities on managing the risk and mitigating uh, the, you know, the possibility. And so the team spends a lot of time right now in discussions about government. Uh, public safety resources are limited. Uh, you know, they definitely may or may not be able to dedicate a person. Is that done on a regional statewide basis in terms of having the expertise uh, with these networks to be able to uh, focus on the cyber risk? So, you know, once again, this, this team is looking at the big picture of once you go to implement what the recommendations will be on the controls, um, not only what is it going to cost, but the consideration that we may have agencies that can't afford to do some of these things. So what are the lower cost um, impacts? Uh, we will come forth with our recommendations and conclusions as normal in the report structure. Next slide, please. So in order to tackle um, this report, we are actually uh, divided into two sub teams. Uh, you might recall in our last report, we had the technical sub team of cyber security experts that were really looking at uh, what the risks were, the types of, of threats that would come on our networks, and then develop the use cases. We we maintain that team, and you know anyone is always welcome to work on these sub teams. But we also created the best practices review. Um, sub team. This group is looking at the existing best practices and will partner with the technical team on the development. And we are in that process right now of what new best practices will need to be developed um, and recommended to the council. We work on a weekly basis, um, whether it's the full working group or the two sub teams. Um, and we do have a baseline document in, in draft status. It, as all these reports, they're a living document uh, and contributions are coming in. But at this point, uh, Madam Chair and to the council, we fully expect to meet the February 17th schedule. Uh, Tom Breen may have us working through the holidays, but I'm trying to um, tell him we don't have to do that right now. So, and if Tom's listening, he's just probably said, I can't believe she said that. Uh, he is our taskmaster, master, and I am so grateful to have him uh, in that role for us. Next slide, please. 
So Madam Chair, that concludes our report, report for working group four. Um, it will be a, um, once, a good, once again, a very valuable contribution for the industry and public safety. And at this time, I'll ask uh, if there's any questions. Thank you, Mary, and also working group four. Um, and uh, we're gonna turn our attention now to working group six. And standing in for Danny McPherson is Yong Kim. Yong, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So uh, let's see, uh, this, I'll be providing an update on the SIP security vulnerability update. Uh, next slide. All right, let's go to slide 70, which will be the working group background slide. I think there's a bit of a lag there. So um, once the system catches up, we'll be on slide 71, which will be the working group objective. Uh, the work group has continued to focus on SIP security vulnerabilities and our objectives and our goals objective is really uh, consistent with what we started off with is looking at security vulnerabilities that's affecting SIP and addressing how industry are addressing these vulnerabilities, looking at gaps uh, within the industries and security protocols and, and then work on developing best practices for the industry. Next slide, please. Um, slide 72 will be sort of uh, this is sort of the uh, uh, so the, uh, the the completion and progress slide. So the work group continues to make good progress. This is a due in part to our section leads who've been very engaged. Uh, we've been very fortunate to have really active, engaged section leads that have been driving a lot of the content. And since the last council update, the work group has brought on a technical writer, uh, Matt Thomas, to support the work group, and he's been very engaged and. The nice thing about this particular individual has been that there's been very low ramp up time to supporting the work group and has been engaged with the session leads and and been starting to pull our first draft together. So that's been a uh, extreme benefit and helpful to the work group as we're trying to consolidate and aggregate all the contents that's being developed. Uh, the work group has held an interim briefing. Uh, for, uh, thankful to Tony Fryer from Bologna Systems and David Maxwell from GSMA. Uh, they were uh, they, they were generous enough to provide a preview into their SIPSEC work that they're working on and their insight uh, and, and the timing of the work was very appreciated. And, and I know that we're looking at how to incorporate or, or use some of that work to influence the work that we're doing as well, too. Uh, next slide, please. So our timeline, uh, we are still on track, no deviations or no red flags regarding the output for our first draft for uh, uh, for the final draft, excuse me for March 21st, and I know that we are working towards a uh, first draft uh, for the end of January. Next slide. And, uh, you know, it, it's, 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 it's amazing to hear, and this seems to be a sort of a continued theme with all the work group, how, how fortunate we are with, with the work group participant, you know, it's, and, and sort of, uh, you know, Danny's the chair and, and, and my, and as an alternate participant, I'm always just, uh, you know, so humbled at just the, the, the roster of folks that are in this work group and the wealth of knowledge that they bring to the, to, to this working group. Uh, some of the, uh, the, what do you call it, the reference documents that we're looking at referring to, you know, you know, folks on this list are the reference. And so I'm, I'm very humbled and appreciative of the talent, skills, and the knowledge that is uh, participating in this uh, in this work group. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, and then the the alternates as well too. I mean, Addis has been uh, extremely helpful and generous with with uh, with their support. And then the alternates from uh, the uh, from the uh, from the companies have been just as engaged, just as powerful in regards to their knowledge and their and their engagements that they brought to the work group as well too. So, uh, next slide, please. And then regarding next steps, uh, again, as I mentioned, no, no red flags. Uh, we'll continue to work on the content and drive towards developing the first draft. Uh, we look forward to sharing that, uh, the, uh, the readout again for the, for the next council update. And again, uh, the final delivery date is uh, March of 2021. So uh, next slide. And so I'll open it up for any questions. Thank you much, very much, uh, Young Kim and Working Group 6 uh, for the group update. Um, a couple of things. Uh, we will have our last meeting in March 
um, and essentially it will be March 10th of 2021. Uh, same time as planned, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern um, will be the time period that will start. It will be a very large meeting because we'll essentially have four readouts of the working groups um, and their final reports. And so it may be longer than the last several that we've had. At this time, we're, we are planning, um, we are thinking it's going to be a virtual event, um, but if that changes, uh, Suzanne and Korean will make sure that we're aware of that. Um, I would like to thank um, the FCC, Suzanne and Korean, and also I think it's Jeff who's basically made the transition to Microsoft Teams um, an exceptional um, experience. I know we were all worried and we all had the uh, check base last week. So thank you very much, and I hope I got I hope I got the name correct. Um, and with that, um, I'm going to just say I hope everybody stays healthy uh, throughout the the holiday season that we're about to embark on. And uh, Godspeed to all the vaccine manufacturers and healthcare providers that will be part of getting us all inoculated sometime in 2021. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back to Suzanne uh, for any closing comments that she may have, and uh, we will adjourn, um, you know, the, the meeting early. Suzanne? Thank you, Charlotte. Um, first, I'd like to thank Working Group 2 for an excellent set of reports addressing the management of security risk in the transition to 5G. And in particular, I'd like to thank Kathy, who seamlessly took over from um, steering the group from Lee when he retired earlier this year. She stepped right into his very big boots to fill, and she's done an excellent job, and we really appreciate it. Um, thank you also for the updates from the rest of the chairs, Mich Michelle, Farouk, Mary, and Yang. I want to I want to discuss a quick piece of um, administrative business. Craig Fugate, who has served as the chair of Working Group One, was recently asked by the Biden transition team to help them with the transition. Big congratulations to Craig. Um, but unfortunately for us, that will prevent him from continuing to serve as chair of Working Group One for the remainder of the specific charter. So I have asked um, Terry Brooks of T-Mobile and Michelle Minnelli of the National Weather Service to please step in and co-chair the group through the end of the charter, which is in March. Um, so they both agreed. I'd like to thank them. And, um, and then please note that the final meeting of CISRC 7 is on March 10th, and there will be four reports, the reports that we heard updates on today. Um, presented at that final meeting. So please mark your calendars now as we're going to need a full quorum and it'd be great if we could get everyone um, present at that meeting virtually. Um, and I second Charlotte in saying that I hope everyone stays healthy and has a wonderful holiday season. And as always, uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or concerns or to Korean. And um, thank you all for participating today. We, uh, as always, Deeply appreciate your commitment to CISRIC. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.